Occupational English test, sample test two, listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four. Complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a doctor talking to Chloe, an outpatient in the psychiatric unit. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Oh, hello, Chloe. I understand you've been in the medical ward recently. How are you feeling now? Oh, much better, thank you, doctor. What exactly was the trouble? Well, it all started about six months ago when I went to my local GP, and he gave me some Valium. As soon as I started taking it, I began feeling terribly anxious. Then one afternoon, I didn't dare cross the road because my legs suddenly felt too heavy to walk. A couple of months later, I started getting these dizzy spells. That was probably about four months ago now.、Mm -hmm. That had lasted about an hour. I left hospital three weeks ago, and since then, I haven't had any problems. Okay, good. Can you tell me anything else about that day in the street? Anything else about your symptoms? Well, I felt like I was going to fall over, like I was all shifty, as if I was moving even though I was standing still. Everything around me was normal, but I felt all trembly and quite unsteady on my feet.、Mm. It didn't last very long, but like I told you earlier, I didn't feel like I could walk properly. My legs were heavy, and I had these palpitations. I guess it was like a panic attack or something. Whenever it happened, it felt like my heart started banging in my chest, and I got all breathless. I went to see my GP, then he sent me here. Right.、Um... You mentioned your legs felt heavy. Not only my legs, my arms too. Whenever it's happened, it felt like I couldn't lift anything. I've had like this tingling sensation too. It usually happened later in the day, in the evening, when I was coming home from work or from doing the shopping, something like that. I've been very busy with working and cooking and doing all the other household chores. I guess I've been feeling a lot of stress. Do you have any other health complaints? Yes, I have arthritis in my hands. I've been told it's in the early stages, and that it's only going to get worse as I get older. When the pain's bad, like it has been recently, it makes it so difficult to do things. What about your personal situation? Are you married? I am. Yes, almost two years now. We don't have any children yet, though. When my husband and I first got married, we talked about starting a family. We have tried, but nothing's happened. We saw someone recently, a gynecologist, a couple of times about trying to fall pregnant. She told me to continue with the temperature chart, and she talked about timing for intercourse, things like that. My husband also had a test, and we're going to go back in a month or so to get the results and see if there's anything else we should be doing. Would you say you and your husband have a good relationship?、Uh, I think so. Yes, we have our little tiffs sometimes, but what couple doesn't? What sort of things do you fight about? Oh,、uh, I don't know. Silly things, like how clean the house is. 
my husband's a bit of a neat freak and sometimes I just haven't got the energy or the time to do it and my hands hurt. And anyway, it's his house as much as it is mine. So it's his responsibility too. Well, you're right there. Now, Chloe, I'm going to write you a prescription for some Ativan. It'll help with any anxiety that you might have been experiencing. And I'd like you to come back and see me again in two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Extra. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a nurse talking to a patient called Mr. McDonald. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mr. MacDonald. I understand you're here to have a lump removed from your back, and the plan is to send you home later today. Yes, that's right. The lump really needs to come off. It's more than a little annoying, and it can be quite painful too. It's near my waist and gets in the way of the waistband of my trousers. I'm not particularly worried about the surgery. They explained everything to me very clearly when I was at the assessment clinic, but I am concerned about how I'll go later on when I'm recovering. Did they tell you I have Parkinson's disease? Yes, it's here in your notes from the clinic. But it doesn't say how long you've had it or anything about how it affects you. Oh, I've had it a few years now. Five, I think. The walking is the worst. It's difficult to start moving, and I'm so slow. All I can do is shuffle to start with, and then my steps get shorter and shorter, and I get faster and faster. Sometimes I even fall over. Right, I see. I also sometimes get that freezing thing that happens. You know, where you're stuck in the one spot. Aching something, I think they call it. Achinesia. Yes, maybe. You'd know better than me. Anyway, it'll come on me when I least expect it. And always at the worst possible moment. I worked out that if I try and do more than the one thing at once, that almost always brings it on. I also get this terrible shaking in my hands. And it's hard to do some things because my arms are so stiff. What activities are most difficult for you? It sounds ridiculous, but it's mainly things like turning over in bed, reaching for a glass of water or a plate of food, getting up out of a chair and then turning around once I'm standing. That can be a challenge. I've learned a few tricks to help though, like having a good firm mattress and a high back chair with arms. What about activities that need fine movement? How do you manage with those? Well, tying my shoelaces is a real problem. And buttons. Doing those up is almost impossible. I like that material that sticks to itself. It's very handy. What's it called again? Velcro. That's it. Also, my handwriting is terrible. I've basically given up on it. It sounds like you might benefit from seeing an occupational therapist. Yes, maybe. I'll have to speak to my GP about a referral. One of the other main problems I've had during the past 12 months has been the cramps I get at night. They really ruin my sleep. I understand your medication has been changed recently. Yes, that's right. I said to the doctor they'd gone on for far too long, so she said I should try some different tablets. I've only been on them for a month or so, but I think they've really reduced. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. 
Complete your answers as you listen. Now, read the question. Hello, Mrs. Cox. Come on in and sit down. Oh, thank you. How are you today? Oh, fine, thanks. And how's your father doing since we last spoke? Oh, up and down. I'm still finding he seems to be getting increasingly forgetful and he get confuses easily. And this makes him really frustrated. Right. Uh, so, as you remember from last time, we did a range of tests on your father. Mm hmm and based on those results, it does look like he's developed an early onset Alzheimer's disease. Oh. So that would probably account for his memory loss, his feelings of hopelessness and, and his anger at times as well. well. What do you think the next step is then? We can't do a lot about his memory, but we can help him to change his mood and enjoy life more. Uh, there's some good medications around and that may slow the deterioration. I think it's important that he goes back to the aged care home and, and find some enjoyment in the activities that they do. It's difficult to determine the long-term outlook, but we'll start him on the medication and we'll check on him again in a couple of weeks to see how he's going. Okay, thank you, Doctor. I'm grateful for all your help. Question 26. You hear a consultant giving a talk to a group of trainees. Now, read the question. The first 24 hours after a head injury are the most important although after effects may appear much later. It's important that the patient is woken every two hours for the first 24 hours. If they're recovering at home, then this should be by someone responsible who is able to also watch for the following symptoms. Persistent headache, nausea, or vomiting. Weakness, numbness, or paralysis of the arms or legs. Blood or clear fluid coming from the ears or nose blurred vision or one pupil larger than the other, and convulsions. If any of these occur, then the person will need to call their GP immediately or return to the hospital emergency department. Question 27. You hear a vet talking to a client who brought his pet cat Jimmy to the vet clinic. Now read the question. Okay, the examination has revealed large amounts of struvite crystals in Jimmy's urethra, so that's why he's had difficulty urinating. The good news is that there's no bladder stones and no major blockages. Oh, that's good. And his kidneys are fine, so there's no evidence of damage. Oh, that's great. Yeah, but I need you to understand that this condition is very painful and distressing for Jimmy. Okay, right. So, it's certainly a significant problem at the moment, and he'll continue experiencing difficulty in urinating. And for male cats in particular, there is a risk of developing a urethral obstruction, which can be fatal. How do you make sure that doesn't happen then? Well, we can make some dietary changes, which will definitely help. But I'd also like to know if Jimmy's been feeling stressed at all lately. Have there been any changes in his living environment? Well, we have been doing upper house at the moment. Ah, that could do it. Stress is definitely a contributing factor with this condition. Question 28. You hear the nurse unit manager discussing the progress of a patient at a multidisciplinary team meeting. Now read the question. Now on to Margaret Smith 
she's a 68 year old woman who was brought into ED two days ago by her son Jeff. Margaret was diagnosed four years ago with frontotemporal lobar degeneration and has progressively deteriorated in that time. She also has hypertension and depression. Her GP recently started her on an antidepressant medication. She lives at home with her son, who's her sole full-time carer, but nursing staff have been unable to contact him since her admission to hospital. Margaret's shown changes in her social behaviour recently. She's been declining food at home and on the ward the nurses have reported she's holding food in her mouth. She's refusing to take medication. She's been very agitated on the ward and she's yelling out when nursing staff try and assist her and she's been confused and physically aggressive on occasion. She's also calling out regularly for her son. Question 29. You hear a radiographer talking to nursing staff at an aged care centre. Now, read the question. The most important preparation requirements include obtaining a recent EGFR result and providing details of current prescriptions, over-the-counter medications and information on pregnancy status. Please also ensure that patients follow a hydration fast for four hours prior to examination. Patients with a recent history of fever, diarrhoea and dialysis are not suitable to undergo CT scans with contrast use. The examination takes between 10 and 45 minutes depending on the procedure type and possible side effects include nausea, vomiting and dizziness. The CT contrast usually stays in the patient's system for 48 hours after the injection and following the examination I recommend advising patients to drink plenty of extra water as this encourages secretion of the CT contrast media. Finally, if any complications such as allergic reactions, decreased urine output, confusion or blood in urine occur, then please inform your patients to let medical staff know as soon as possible. Question 30. You hear a GP discussing psoriasis with a patient. Now read the question. got something called chronic plaque psoriasis on your elbows and knees, but don't worry, we can treat it. You definitely benefit from some light treatment to help your rash settle down. I'd recommend coming up to the physiotherapy department twice a week to have UVB light treatment. Are you arranging me to have sunbed treatment, doctor? Well, there are some similarities to sunbed treatment, but actually the lights that we have in hospital are special and they admit only a UVB light. You will get a suntan though. Sounds great. When can I start? There's a bit of a waiting list, so I'll give you this cream to be getting on with first. Take the form to the physiotherapy department and they'll book you in for six weeks of UBB treatment. All the best then. Thank you. That is the end of part B. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear a nurse called Sally Perkins giving a presentation on tetanus to a group of hospital trainees. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6.
Good morning. My name's Sally Perkins and I'm one of the registered nurses working here at the hospital. Very soon I'm going to highlight the importance of immunisation and medical treatment for tetanus infection by talking about some case reports. But first I'd like to give you a little background on the disease. Tetanus is caused by a toxin produced in bacteria found worldwide in soil, dust and manure and it can contaminate many surfaces and substances. Because of this, the disease cannot be eradicated completely, but infection can be prevented through immunisation with tetanus toxoid containing vaccines. People who contract tetanus and recover do not have natural immunity, so they can be reinfected and therefore also need to be immunised. To be protected throughout life, the World Health Organisation recommends that an individual receives six doses of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine which can be done through a routine immunisation program. Tetanus is characterised by painful muscular contractions and spasms. Involvement of the muscles of the jaw and neck has led to tetanus also being known as lockjaw. It's not directly transmitted from person to person. Instead, the bacteria enters the body through a cut or wound. The majority of patients develop the disease as a result of a deep wound or puncture but even a tiny pinprick or scratch can be enough for the bacteria to enter the body. Although tetanus cases are much rarer than they used to be, tetanus is still a life-threatening disease because of inadequate vaccination levels and inappropriate wound care. Another major issue is that only one-third of people who have a tetanus-prone wound actually seek medical treatment. One of the main reasons given by people for not getting tetanus vaccine is that we already have high levels of naturally occurring antitoxin through unintentionally ingesting the tetanus bacteria in day-to-day -day living, granting natural immunity without ever needing a single dose of medication or vaccination. Others state that if you've potentially been exposed to tetanus, fully cleaning the wound will reduce the potential for bacteria to enter the bloodstream. The problem with these approaches is that if you've been infected and aren't aware of it, medical treatment may come too late. Now I'd like to present some case studies to illustrate the danger of taking tetanus protection for granted. First, the case of a 45-year-old woman who lives on a farm and sought medical care after experiencing leg, back and jaw pain, although she had no specific injury. Because the woman was also having difficulty breathing, doctors had to do a tracheotomy and put her on a ventilator. After two weeks in intensive care, the patient faced weeks of physical rehabilitation. In all, the woman was hospitalised for six weeks of medical care. Because the symptoms were recognised early on and because the woman hadn't completely stopped breathing, she was able to make a complete recovery. She had not received a regular tetanus booster shot and the status of her primary vaccination was unknown. The second incident I'd like to share with you occurred when a four-year-old boy was taken by his parents to the GP with a one-week history of general malaise, mild fever, lethargy and weight loss. He subsequently developed dysphagia, difficulties opening his mouth and dehydration. Due to the concerns about the boy's refusal of fluids, the paediatrician was consulted. The boy then began to show signs of locked jaw and muscle rigidity. Together with the lack of immunisation and a toenail infection, this finally led to the diagnosis of tetanus. The boy was then transferred to a paediatric intensive care unit for initial treatment. Initially, the frequency and severity of his muscle spasms increased during the day in ICU, but he did make a full recovery after four further weeks of treatment. The final case involves an otherwise healthy 53-year-old man who arrived at the emergency department of his local hospital complaining of severe stiffness in his jaw and difficulty swallowing, but without any apparent wounds or cuts. Following an exhaustive examination and attempts to alleviate his symptoms, a diagnosis of tetanus was made by the medical team. He was treated with tetanus immunoglobulin and tetanus toxoid and kept unconscious for two weeks. The man was discharged after spending nearly a month in hospital, including his nearly three-week stay in the ICU, and he was not able to recall the date of his last tetanus vaccination. I'm sure you'll agree this case highlights how everyone is at risk of the disease.
Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Delia Mean, who was Team USA's Chief Medical Officer at the Sochi Winter Olympic Games. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. So, Dr. Mean, what did being CMO mean? Well, it meant overseeing 77 other healthcare professionals and taking care of 228 U.S. Olympians. As a CMO, I worked in tandem with a team to deliver the highest level of care to our athletes. We were using the latest technology, evaluating a mix of treatments to ensure peak performance, and were ready to respond to whatever might have come our way. It also meant working long and busy hours during the games where the team faced everything from common colds and illness to traumatic injury. And it also meant having compassion and understanding while applying your medical expertise in a fast-moving environment. Can you give me a behind-the-scenes description of what the medical support of the athletes looked like? Yes, absolutely. Well, it looked pretty much like any medical clinic you might be familiar with. There were dozens of boxes shipped to Sochi so that we were able to care for our athletes. Our doctors saw everything from coughs and flu to sprains and breaks. As a result, we had a comprehensive team assembled to address whatever health-related need might have come through the door. We looked like a mix of care providers such as athletic trainers and physical therapists or chiropractors and massage therapists to assess and provide the best solution to the problem. Our goal was to have our athletes back on the slope, track, or rink as fast as possible, performing at their peak. I see. And uh, who cared for the athletes if there was a life-threatening injury? Well, if a situation like that had arisen, and I'm very happy to be able to say that thankfully it didn't, the intervention of doctors, specialists, and emergency providers from the Olympic Organizing Committee and our Team USA doctors would have absolutely been vital. We always had one of our physicians with the team during training and at competitions at the various sites. That gave us the flexibility to provide immediate care should the situation have occurred. We felt pretty confident that through our collaborative efforts, we could care for our athletes in just about any situation. Well done. And how did you approach injury prevention? Preventing injuries was certainly a major part of the support we provided. Aiding athletes and coaches to condition appropriately and prime their bodies with good nutrition and recovery efforts while in Sochi was all part of the whole care that we provided while we were there. We were able to use technology to assess and evaluate our athletes to ensure they were at their peak to perform. The travel and extreme competition did take a toll on the athletes' bodies, but we did our best to keep our athletes healthy in every respect. And were there any new technologies used by the U.S. medical team in Sochi? Well, one of the tools we used was a groundbreaking form of software which provided our physicians and athletes the ability to communicate health information instantaneously and securely. The software maintained diagnostics, treatment evaluations, and test results, and it was all accessible virtually. 
This was especially critical when we were traveling from venue to venue in a foreign country. I have since actually implemented the same software in my private practice. Now, no matter who is involved in the patient's care, the healthcare professional has easy access to all the critical information and can respond accordingly. We also had several ultrasound machines that we traveled with, which was an incredible diagnostic tool for many musculoskeletal injuries. And finally, how might other young physicians follow in your footsteps? Well, I would encourage any physician that aspires to this kind of uh, appointment to begin connecting with officials in their area of interest. My work with the U.S. cycling team helped build my reputation among other elite sport organizations, where I was able to establish relationships and convey my interest in working with them. You know, it can take a lot of time volunteering, but the work is invigorating and stimulating because you learn so much in the process, especially if you're passionate about it. I really do believe I am a better physician and surgeon because I've had the chance to work in these various situations. I can bring that experience back to my private practice, which elevates care for everyone. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.